Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Uh, certainly is a very um, well, well, blessed Sabbath, should I say. Uh, it made me actually think about lots of things and start with. Um, I was reminded and somehow when I was not even a member of the church, I came to um, Seventh-day Adventist Church and as a new person, sit in the church, listen to the song that was playing with my tears dripping down from my face as a foreigner sitting in this country. Uh, it's, it's a memory I actually never forget. But isn't that a blessing that find brothers and sisters in Christ? And that's why we're all sitting here, aren't we? As a family, as a family, this is your home. And this is your home. So, yeah, so that's the welcome I can say. Um, let's have a word of prayer first to welcome our Father in heaven to join us together. Dear Father in heaven, um, it's such a, a pleasure and to uh, worship together and to sing praises unto you. And this is our sincere prayer and that your Holy Spirit will guide us and guide us service. May our heart be open to receive your glory and as we expect in the soon coming of Christ. And especially on the Sabbath day, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Well, good morning. Before I start the story today, I just wanted to say that I always feel so blessed when I'm asked to share a story with you. And do you know why that might be? It's because I get the opportunity to sit right here and to look out at all your lovely, happy, smiling faces. And that really makes me happy. So thank you for being here this morning and for blessing me today. And I hope that this story will be a blessing to you. So today's story is about a boy named Tom and his younger sister called Molly. And it's a story about deception and learning lessons the hard way. And the title of the story is The Clock That Didn't Tell the Right Time. Tom and his sister Molly just hated going to bed early every evening. They felt it just wasn't fair. Mum would call them just when they were having such a lot of fun or just when they were in the middle of something interesting. Tom, Molly, she would call, pack up your toys now, it's time for bed. It was hard enough in the winter time to leave the bright fireside and trudge upstairs to a coldish bedroom. But when the summer came, it was so much harder because outside it was still light and warm. And anyway, they knew lots of children from nearby houses who were allowed to stay up much later than them. Sometimes Tom and Molly felt a little rebellious and they would beg their mother to let them stay up later too. But mum always had a good excuse for packing them off to bed early. You know, it is much better for you to snuggle down into your beds before it gets too late, children, she would say. Then when the morning comes, you will feel bright and fresh and ready for another happy day. Children who have the proper amount of sleep have rosy cheeks and sparkling eyes and they don't get sick very often. One lovely summer's evening, Tom and Molly were having a great time in the garden, playing in the treehouse their dad had built for them. Dinner was over and they knew they had about an hour left before it would be time for them to go in. Mum and Dad had called out to say that they were just going down the road for a little while to visit old Mrs Norwood, who hadn't been feeling very well lately. So Tom and Molly were home, all alone. And that's when a naughty little thought scampered into Molly's mind and a twinkle sprang into her eye. I'm thinking, Tom, we don't want to go to bed early tonight. It's so lovely out here and I'm really enjoying myself. Hmm, I know what. Why don't you go into the house and turn back the hands of the clock so that it says six o'clock instead of seven o'clock? Now, this is a very old clock that belongs to Mr. Alice, and I need to take very good care of it. So, let me get it to seven o'clock. That will mean that we can stay up a whole hour later and no one will know what we have done. Please do it, Tom. Please do it, she begged. 
Now Tom, who should have known better as he was two years older than his sister, was also enjoying her, himself and he didn't want to go to bed either. So into the house he crept. He glanced through the front room window to make sure that his parents were not in sight. And then he slipped out into the hall where the old clock on the wall steadily ticked away the minutes. He had to climb up on a chair, but he knew what to do. As he, he knew what to do, as he had watched his father many times open the glass front and wind up the clock with his big key. Now, it wasn't difficult to move the clock hands back one hour, so instead of seven o'clock, he changed the time to make it six o'clock. Sorry. He got down off his chair and he put it back in its usual place. And then Tom ran back out to the treehouse where he and Molly, Molly had a little giggle between themselves. They felt that they had been very clever as putting the hands of the clock back meant that they had one whole extra hour to play. Soon enough, Mum was at the back door calling Tom, calling Tom, Molly, come in quickly. We've been out much longer than we had intended, but Mrs Norwood was so glad to see us. Come in now, it's time to get ready for bed. Even though Tom and Molly were feeling quite sleepy and weary by this time, they came in very unwillingly as usual. But when they said good night, that good night, they looked knowingly at each other. They almost wanted to laugh out loud, thinking of the way that they had tricked Mum and Dad. Perhaps they could do the same thing another time. They were still sound asleep the next morning when Dad called up from the bottom of the stairs. Tom, Molly, wake up you two. Bounding upstairs, he was soon in their room. Wake up, it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining brightly and as I have a day off work, I thought we could go for a trip to the beach for the day. If we hurry, we can catch the nine o'clock train. It will only take us about 10 minutes to walk to the station. It's eight o'clock now, so get ready to go. Tom and Molly jumped out of bed excited. Oh, the rush to find their swimming togs and their spades and buckets and a net in case there were fish to catch in the rock pools. Then there was breakfast to gobble down. Tom and Molly were really too excited to eat, but at last they were all walking quickly along the road to the station. Hurry, hurry, cried Tom and Molly. We're going to have such a fun day at the beach. When they arrived at the station, Father looked at his watch and said, it's five minutes before nine o'clock. The train should be coming any minute now, so I'll go and get the tickets. Mum, Tom and Molly crowded up to the window of the ticket office and heard Dad say, two return adult tickets and two children tickets to the beach, please. There's a nine o'clock train, isn't there? But the ticket officer frowned and looking over the rims of his glasses, he asked, did you say the nine o'clock train, sir? I'm sorry, but you've missed that train. It left nearly an hour ago. The next train to the beach doesn't depart until it's this afternoon. Oh dear, said Dad, that's too bad. We won't be able to go to the beach today after all as it will be too late to travel on the afternoon train. Oh well, come on guys, let's head home. But Dad, said Tom, gulping down a horrible feeling that was growing up inside of him, what happened to your watch? Why is it a whole hour late? Well, it was a real mystery to me, Tom. Last night, when Mum and I got home from our visit to Mrs Norwood, I was surprised to see the clock in the hall said a quarter to eight, while my watch said a quarter to nine. But that old clock in the hall is so regular and faithful, it never loses a minute. So I changed my watch to tell the same time as the old clock. Tom... You wouldn't know anything about that mystery, would you? With kindness, Tom's father looked into his son's troubled eyes. Tom slowly dropped his head and a red flush crept up his neck and over his face. Dad glanced over at Molly just in time to see big, big tears trickling down her cheeks. 
Come on, Mum, said Dad. Let's head home. I have a feeling that our two rascals here have learned a hard lesson today that they won't forget in a hurry. Remember at the beginning of the story, I told you, at the beginning, I told you that the story was a t story about deception. Does anyone know what deception means? No? I deceive others when I lie, or if I distort the facts, or if I make up stories, or if I hide the truth, or when I try to mislead someone in some way. Do you think that Tom and Molly deceived their parents? I see some nodding heads. Yes, they did. Did they lie to their parents? Yes, they did. Did they distort the facts? They did, because they changed the time. And did they hide the truth? Yes, because they didn't tell their parents what they had done. Do you think that their deception brought a good result or a bad result? A bad? Yeah. I think, though, initially, to start with, it brought a good result for them, didn't it? Because Tom and Molly thought that changing the time actually brought a positive result for them because they got to have an extra hour to play before heading to bed. But their deception did ruin their whole next day when they missed the train and missed out on spending the day at the beach. Do you know of another deceiver? Who else is out there trying to deceive? Satan. He told the first lie, didn't he? He distorted the facts. He hid the truth. And he did this in the Garden of Eden when he told Eve that she was allowed to eat the fruit from the tree that God had told them not to. And since that day, Satan continues to deceive people. What do you think is the opposite to deception? What's the opposite to telling a lie? Being kind. Being kind. The opposite to telling a lie is telling the truth. Telling the truth, that's right. And when I look in my Bible, it tells me in John 14, verse 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This means that not only did Jesus speak true words, he is actually truth. So when you attempt to, de to, to deceive, to tell a lie, to change, distort the facts... I want you to remember the story of Tom and Molly and the clock that didn't tell the right time. And I want you to ask yourself, do I want to be a deceiver like Satan? Or do I want to be honest and truthful like Jesus? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, please help these children and us adults here this morning choose to follow you in always being honest in both our thoughts and our actions. Amen. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me. Before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. to follow Jesus, no 
turning back, no turning back. Indeed, will you decide to follow Jesus? May I invite the congregation to please stand together with us as we sing the first two verses again. found in Hebrews chapter 9 verses 13 to 15 and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by, mean, by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Happy Sabbath again. <clears throat> I'm not sure what my, um, my hair says on or not. Now, just now, actually, I introduced myself a little bit during introductions. Definitely, you understand I'm not come from this country originally, um, and uh, but when I have a look at kids and over here sitting over here, um, now just remind me in my classrooms because I'm a teacher as well. Sometimes, uh, maybe I talk too much, and you know, it's the, the the words come out from one year going out and from the other. Sometimes it happened to me as well. Hopefully, that's not the case. And for you um, today, because when, um, when I was a, a university student next door, um, I used to call my mom, and at that time, obviously, culture is new to me, language is new to me, and I would say to my mom, just hiding my nerve and say, okay, um, I can really focus on my study. So the, the, the saying in Chinese that we say is, um, is this, just make sure I have the first page, in Chinese, we call it 两耳不闻窗外事一心只读圣贤书. I know I'm speaking in tongues over here. You don't understand if you're not Chinese. But I'll translate this. Basically, it says, if you close, I mean, basically, I won't close my two years into whatever happened outside the window. I only want to focus on reading the set, sagest books. Now, sagest books, now, in Chinese, we have uh, lots of... Um, books uh, full of wisdom, and then you might call it Confucius and Mencius, Lao Tzu, uh, different books, and that's actually what we're referring to. Now, I want to call this two year shut attitude, or sometimes you can call it that's not my business attitude. But Jesus is not like that. Now, uh, first Peter actually remind us that cast all cares upon him because he cares for you. Well, he's not just caring about you because he's a friend or he's a parent or he's a teacher because he's responsible for the classroom, but he cares for you because you are his own. As the Bible says in that, um, in Genesis, it says that uh, in the image of God um, that he created us um, and she, uh, he and she, he created them. Um, and then that's, that's obvious that we understand. And God is our creator. That's the pure reason why we sit over here, listen to his word. And so 
Before I'm going to start preaching, focus on the topic of ownership. I'm not sure you can see it from, from the TV. Um, I'm going to look into three different things uh, based on the Bible, the Scripture. And let's have a word of prayer first before we step in. So I just invite you to bow your heads while I pray uh, by kneeling down. Thank you. Dear Father in heaven, um, when we come to your presence, we receive you love and warmth, but at the same time, um, my heart trembles because I'm standing in sacred ground. And I know I'm unworthy to say even a bit of your truth, um, to share on behalf and on this platform, um, but as the Bible says, that your word is like two-edged sword. Please and cut off anything is not worthy uh, from me. May our heart be open and to receive your truth, regardless of what position, what life we're going through. We know that you have word for us today. So please um, guide my voice, uh, guide my thoughts. May that not be mine, but yours. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you got your Bible, I'd like to uh, ask you to turn to um, the book of Luke, chapter 15. Now, this is um, a very familiar story. We understand there are actually three um, parables talking about something is lost. Now, we're going to focus on uh, a bit of it for the prodigal son. So uh, it's going to be Luke 15. But we won't go through the story by simply reading um, the word, but we're going to actually highlight different things that we want to point out so that we can be drawn closer uh, to his word over here. Now, we understand the son actually ran away from his father. He requested everything he could from his father for the inheritance. Um, now, the question you might ask, why? Maybe the world is too exciting just to, to skip that. So that's why he went and with everything that actually the Bible says over here in fifth, um, chapter 15, verse 13, he say, uh, it says, There, I was talking about the son actually went to a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, when you think about what is the most precious commodity in your life, you probably can think about lots of things, but I will actually comment on time. Now, as a math teacher, I won't show you a formula, but we all understand how long roughly we can live. If you count how many days you have, it's roughly about 29,000 days. Now, if you count off a third of your time sleeping, which is most of us do, and count off one year you spend your toilet, most of us do. Um, there are lots of time actually wasted. At the end, we don't really have lots of time to waste. Now, this is purely what the sun's going through over here. But now, the thing is, not until famine and hunger strike, not until humiliation actually hurt too much that he realized why I'm here in the first place. So the thing is, hasn't actually the Bible mentioned in that um, when Jesus mentioned all the things and do the nation of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that you have need of the things, but rather seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things shall be added unto you. Has actually been the Bible says that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Now, why are you talking about hostility, like hostile? It's, it's more like, it's not like I have a fight with my wife and that's, we become hostile to each other. No, you're talking about a war between two countries. Are you in war with God? So over here it says quite clearly, friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Hmm. But thank God 
we always quote that verse that all things work together for the good and for those who trust him. And, and thank God also this young man to choose to return to his father. And if you actually turn um, a little bit over here to page um, 18. It's page 18, that sounds speaking say, sorry, not page 18, uh, my bad. It's verse 18, chapter 15. It says, I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, or against you. And I'm not... Uh, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son, and make me as one of thy hired servant. And continue over here. We we know we remember what things as described the father when the son is actually running. Sorry, when the one son is coming to his father. Verse twenty says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. And had compassion and run, and fell on his neck and kissed him. You are his own. Just like the verses we caught just now, that he created you, every single person sitting over here is his own. Now, if I ask the rest of hand, probably not, but how many of you, because the love of a father sit over here? Or how many of you, because of prayers of a mother that sit in this room today? Now, here is my home. Now, if you trace at, um, the beginning of the chapter 15, we understand over here Jesus really addressing to um, um, Pharisees and scribes. And the well, Pharisees and scribes questioning why Jesus choose um, the companionship of sinners and show that his mission to the world was to seek the lost, obviously. And uh, in Mark chapter 2, over here, and the Pharisees actually asked the same question to Jesus' disciples. And Jesus' disciples, and sorry, just bring back my clicker. I think this will be a slide coming up soon. And in the, um, the book of Mark, just to make sure that the slides is going. Thank you. It's over here in the book of Mark. It says that Jesus said to them, and they that are whole have no need of physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. Were Pharisees righteous? Or are you righteous now how can we actually become righteous or how can we become a whole uh, i just want you to hold on to the chapter and turn just a couple of chapters to uh, luke 17 just quickly point out in luke 17 in verse 11 it's talking about the story of 10 lepers we understand there are 10 people over there and so Jesus coming and shout out for help. Master, have mercy on us. And we also understand following the story that Jesus told them, go, show yourself unto the priest. What happened to them? They all went. And what happened to them after? They all cleansed. Now, cleansed from all unrighteousness. But hold on, the story that did not actually end up over there. But there is only one stranger that come back, not even his own people. I'm talking about Jews over here. But only one stranger come back, that he thanked God and praised him. And Jesus said this in verse 17, chapter 17. Were there not ten cleansed, but where... Are the nine? Are they not found? They are not found in that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Arise, go thy way. Thy faith 
hath made thee whole. Now, the time while I'm preparing a sermon, I do actually end up listening to a lot, uh, lots of sermons and praise the Lord. Um, and one of the sermons actually preached by um, Pastor Gordon, you can look up in Oxford Church, and then he actually mentioned this point, cleansed and whole. What is the difference? When we come to Christ through our first love, we come, seems like we are saved. We come because that he has done something in our life. We come because he has shown something right that we find that we, com- we convert it because this thing that is right for us, that we come to him. And what Pastor Gordon said is, this stranger give his life to God. And what Billy Graham actually mentioned in terms of this concept, he said, we come we're not just realizing Jesus is our Savior, that we need to call Jesus the Lord. Do you see the difference? Savior, of course, we confess in that we are saved by God, but the Lord is the one that we give a life to. Lord is the one that we serve him every day. Do you want to be made whole? In the matter of fact, actually, that Jesus has said, we're going to read later on from Luke 15, it says, and ye are the light of the world, and ye are the salt of the earth. Let's actually have a look in the following, that the youngest son come back. What happened to the older son? Now, obviously, we, are, we know that what's happened. Let's just read it, have a look. Uh, just go back into Luke 15. Luke 15 there. Now, we understand that when the, young, uh, the older son come back, uh, he's not that happy, right? And the Bible literally mentioned that he was angry, that would not even go in to have celebration together when his younger brother, his own younger brother, that come back, that he said this to his father, that I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, which means I do whatever that he thinks and you ask me to. Yet thou never actually give me a kid or a calf over here. I might make merry with my friends. But now thy son actually come back, which has uh, devoured everything that you give to him, uh, has killed for him a fattened calf. And he said to him, uh, the, the father actually said to him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Now, I was reminded when I was prepared to talk, um, when Cain killed his brother, Abel, and when he was wandering around and God actually asked him this question, where is your brother? And then he answered, am I my brother's keeper? Now the question is, are we our brother's keeper? Um, One thing actually we uh, try to do in the afternoon um, with my small group, um, with our small Chinese group, is I want to look into history over here. Now, uh, uh, there's one thing that really fascinates me is when I come over here, I understand this, this city, right? This city is called a special name. The city is called a name with a church. And then the city actually got Christ in the city's name. I don't see many cities actually with the Christ as the city's name. So this place is literally just called Christ Church. So I want to look into different histories. Uh, as a foreigner, I'm just curious about things happen. So when we look into the history in Christ Church, I come up with a website in the public library. It's mentioned three people. Redley, which is supposed to be named... Oh, sorry, I'm talking about the Cathedral Square. It's supposed to be named after a Bishop uh, Ridley. And then the other two is um, Kramer and also Litma. Now, all the three names, if you know Christchurch quite well, we understand that's the three squares that close to the city center over there. Do you all know that? Okay. So I look into um, what happened over there. Um, it's very fascinating look into 
the history. Now, obviously, that three people are called Oxford martyrs because they're all crucified on a fire stack. Now, talking about the first person over here, let's have a look. Letma, and um, while he was in the position of bishop, would preach publicly the need for the Bible to be translated into English. Now, we're talking about King James Version was only officially available probably 1611. So this was actually well before that, probably 50 years. Now, just keep paying attention over there, which at the time was incredibly dangerous, brothers and sisters. By holding this book, your life is threatened. It's incredibly dangerous. And this, so this is Litma. And Ridley, Ridley would manage to persuade Edward the, uh, the sixth, I think the sixth. So that time Edward was only a young boy. He was proclaimed a king uh, when he was only nine, but he only stayed on the throne for, I forgot, about six or seven years. But he continued with his father, Henry the Eighth Passion, which means continue with um, the, their Protestant belief. All right. So over here, so Ridley actually would ask the king to give some of the room, empty palace in London, to house homeless women and children. But when Mary the first, um, well, this is actually never my history, but I always fascinated to look into something that directs us to the truth. When Mary the first became the queen, she instantly worked to restore. Um, Catholicism, Catholicism, and one of the first thing that she did was to arrest Bishop Letmar and along with Bishop Ridley. And during the trial, Ridley was asked if he believed that Pope was heir to the authority of Peter as the foundation of the church. Ridley stated the church was not built by any man, but on the truth that Peter confessed, and he said Christ was the Son of God. He also denied, this dogma rightly denied, the honor of Pope in Rome and said Catholic Church was seeking his own glory and not the glory of God. I'm simply quoting history. You can look up the story uh, uh, book, uh, history book by yourself. As he was being tri- the tied to the sack, rightly prayed, O Heavenly Father, we're talking about the Cathedral Square, was supposed to be named after rightly himself. Redley prayed, O Heavenly Father, I give thee most hearty thanks for that thou hast called me to be a professor of thee even unto death. I beseech thee, Lord God, take mercy upon this realm of England and deliver the same for all her, sorry, from, from, all, from all her enemies. As a flame rose um, around Lema, he even encouraged his brother Redley and saying, Be of good comfort, brother Redley, Redley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. Now this is the story or history in our city where the squares has been na- named after. In Romans chapter 8, it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness in that our spirit, that we are the children of God. And if children are heirs and heirs of God and co join heirs, uh, heirs with Christ, if so, be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified with Him. You are you, brothers, keeper. You are. Are you sisters, Kipper? Strengthen your brothers, especially at the church. Sisters also. Now, talking about brothers, I have to jump into a story about Jacob and Esau because they are brothers born in the same family, in the same year, in the same month, on the same day. Well, they're twins, but they're so different, aren't they? 
Now we understand what Esau was like, right? He's into hunting, and um, and now he's just so so different. The thing is, he trade his birthright for what? For only a purchase of lentils. Okay. So over here, sorry, I read that already. Uh, Mrs. White actually mentioned this in saying, when he regarded it as a matter worthy of um, scarcely a thought, that was the act that revealed the prevailing trails of his, his character. Um, when we consider things in that is in our life, our choices reflect on who we are. It shows in that his choice and showed his true estimate of what which uh, sorry of that which was sacred and which should have been sacredly cherished. He sold his birthright for a small indulgence to meet his present wants. How many wants do we have? Are we willing to trace that with eternal life? And this determined that after course of his life, that we'll do to our life also. And to Esau, uh, a morsel of meat was more than the service of his master. Well, I can sort of call you so have the sort of it is not my business attitude, right? But um, I'm the first one anyway. So whatever trick that you play, it's just not my business. Even I actually give it to you, what does it matter? Um, <clears throat> I do have a cousin. Um, well, because I haven't really sort of worked in um, as much and as I did over here in New Zealand and back in China. I didn't really have as much experience. And by the way, my cousin is only about three years younger than me. Um, so he's definitely thrived in, in his career. Um, but recently he had a heart surgery. And I was so surprised because he's younger than me. And we sort of joke around, uh, uh, men, we should exercise more. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one thing that he shared is, he said, well, I'll just have a look in a few months, and I should be okay, right? I'll just go back to normal, eat whatever I want, um, and then go back to work. The thing is, um, if I'm okay, I will continue to drink. I'll continue to smoke because that is demanded of me by my career. It's sad, isn't it? Sometimes we seem to run to a position that we don't really have a choice. But isn't that your choice? To draw yourself into that position in the first place? Don't you have a choice for your life? Don't you have decision to make in terms of what you put into your temple of God? We do. Seriously. We do. I just find my place over here. Now, we're going to have a look at the other brother, Jacob, obviously. Um, he's quite different. Obviously, he's, he's, um, he's smart, okay? Um, but he also understands the blessing of God is supposed to be upon him, but he wants to take things over to his own hand. He lied to his brother in the first place. Well, he cheated his, he tricked his brother in doing things. He lied to his father. That's why his name is called Deceiver. He's a liar. He carried that actually all through his life. So over here, no, I'm not sure that's the one actually I'm looking. <clears throat> Apology over here. Uh, so before I should jump over there. Um, now, even after he fled to a foreign country away from his father, his, I'm sorry, away from his brother, just about to kill him, um, and sadly, actually, never say goodbye. Well, never had another chance to see his mother. And he spent twenty years in a foreign land, just walking his his life out, All right? But God actually never forget his people. And this is what happened. God actually called him. Um, let's see, God actually called him and to return and to his to the land that thy fathers. So. Um, 
Genesis in chapter 31, it says, And God called him to return unto the father, the land of thy fathers, and to thy kindred. And God said, I will be with thee. I will be with thee. Now, I do actually want to ask you to turn into Genesis 32. Let's actually look into something um, um, really interesting over here. Genesis 32. Now, this is on the way back, and obviously we understand Jacob went through lots of things, right? Um, and we understand there's Jacob's trouble um, on the way. And, but, so this happened first, and so in Genesis 32, over here, that in verse 10, Genesis 32, verse 10, that on the way, that the, um, sorry, verse 9 over here, Jacob said, O oh God, my father, Abraham, and God of my father, Isaac, Lord, which has said unto me, Return unto thy father. Yes, you called me, but I am unworthy. I'm not worthy, verse 10 says, of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth with which thou hast shown unto thy servant. Hasn't the prodigal son said the same thing? I'm unworthy, father. Take me as a servant. So over here, that Jacob, in uh, the journey um, to his brother, and uh, in great controversy over here, um, Mrs. White mentioned, Satan uh, endeavors to terrify them with the thoughts that their cases are hopeless. Remember when Jacob was wrestling with God and he was holding on, but he never actually let it go, did he? He did feel he's unworthy. He did feel his case is hopeless. He understand his, his brother bringing armies to about kill him. He sent his family. He sent three group of servants ahead and he's behind and he's going through this trouble. And talking about that time, talking about Jacob's trouble, talking about the end time that we have to experience as his people. As Satan is doing something over here that the stain of their defilement will never be washed away. Satan is tempting to let you think that way. And he hoped to so destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptation and, re and turn from their allegiance to God. Now this actually makes me remember the song. Um, wide, wide as the ocean, high as the heaven above, and deep as the deepest sea, so is the love. Anyone can help me? My, savior. My Savior's love. And though I'm so unworthy, still I'm a child of His care. And then help me out. For his word teaches, teaches me that his love reaches me everywhere. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Now, continue with the chapter um, 32, Genesis. You will find something fascinating over here. What Esau going to handle his enemy? who took away everything that he's supposed to have, the birthright, even he tried it that way. Genesis 30, 33, verse 4. And Esau ran to meet him, this is Jacob, and embraced him, this is Jacob, and fell on his knees and kissed him, and they wept. Wasn't that what the father did to the prodigal son? Now, who Jacob actually represent? Wasn't he a blessed son? Wasn't he be called to return to the promised land that we are expecting to go to? Are we welcome him? Now, the Bible actually did refer at the end, there will be people see the truth, see the gospel, and open their arms when Jesus comes back and willing to surrender even their life for the truth. Now, 22nd of April, which is this coming Monday, is a Passover this year in Jewish, a Jewish calendar. 
So I'm going to move on to, from Jacob, to, um, Jacob and Esau to um, Israelites and the Passover. I want to actually present you in a different view of what the Passover is from Chinese culture. Okay. Have a little number over there. Uh, hopefully that you understand what I'm talking about. Obviously you see um, the things that I will explain to you. So, um, I, I will confess all of you are Bible scholars, and so I won't read the, uh, the, the, the Bible for this case. You will understand what I'm talking about over here. Okay. So, for Chinese New Year, obviously, um, it's very celebrated, and every single year Chinese celebrate that. So, New Year scrolls or couplets, and uh, it's always hang up on the door every single Chinese New Year. That's a must. Uh, no discussion. And do you recall that word Israelites was commanded to? So the blood will be stained on the two sides of the door, also the top of the lentils. Okay, so let me just keep going. Uh, dumplings is the must, but the thing is, dumpling, unlike the, um, what do you call it, uh, stemmed bun, uh, with, bun, sorry, which is... Um, which it has East India, but dumpling has not East India, right? Um, if you actually eat dumpling, it has not, hasn't got East India, but it's, I won't say it's compulsory, but we just have to eat it, right? Uh, when I was young, I probably only re remember we eat dumplings less and frequent as this days, but these days we almost eat dumpling every single day, if you want. So dumpling have a dough, uh, has no East India, uh, the wrappers, and, uh, obviously, is without yeast. And the one thing that Jewish actually do this day still is before the festival of Passover, they have to clean up their home, every single corner, the dust, and then remove all the yeast. What yeast represent? Aren't we supposed to remove our sin to welcome the coming of Christ? So let's continue. Um, so garlic chive, and you see the green one over there. Um, I just look into it. Uh, I don't think every Chinese can put garlic chive in, into the dumpling as a filling, but I love it. Uh, so based on the website, the garlic chive not only can prevent constipation, uh, intestinal cancer, um, but it can also um, sort of cleans, cleans up your intestine uh, tract. So you can call it as uh, intestinal cleansing grass. It's, it's not what... Well, it's garlic chive, and so it's, it's a little bit spicy. You can call it bitter. Um, so it's something that actually Jewish um, Israelites was commanded to do. And Chinese, we call it Chinese New Year, also guanian, which means pass the year. Exactly the same as pass over. Now, um, I won't tell you what year is, but there's, a, there's very different stories talking about the year is more like a beast, right? So pass year, or Chinese New Year guanian, is you pass over the beast, Okay, so I probably mentioned this before. Um, we all dress up. Um, in, my, uh, in my memory, when I was young, we always dress up, go to grand, uh, grandparents' in place. Um, we never actually feel as relaxed in this days at home, take off your shoes. We just um, all dress up. Seems like we are preparing something. Uh, wear the best clothes you can, like the new clothes, and just get ready for something. Um, uh, the Bible also says and that Israelites and they're going to gird up their loins. Loins. Yeah. So they're going to prepare next moment. They're going to do what? They're going to leave. They're going to go to the promised land. When Jesus comes, are you ready? Do you know the, the hour? Aren't you supposed to be ready now? Okay, so firework uh, is purely scary. Um, of the... Uh, as, now... It has been banned this day and because of pollution, also the loudness. And I, as I was, remember, was young, my father literally just take a firework. Sorry, the time is going really fast. Um, outside, it's, um, it's literally like a battleground. Sorry, I do have to speed up over here. Um, so the last thing I'm going to highlight over here is the envelope. Um, as a tradition, one thing that you always do, you ask other people sometimes, grandparents and parent, parents for money. Remember what Israelites did this and when they lived in um, Egypt? And God actually asked them to ask the Egyptians and for some gold and silver. Remember? 
So that's what we did. And the last over here, we have to stick this on our door. And that word means blessing. And that word on our door, every single Chinese house will have a blessing on the door because Passover is supposed to be a blessing to you. All right, so let's speed up over here. Hopefully I can do a lot quicker. Now, I'm saying this, well, it's from a Chinese perspective, and then for those who don't really have the culture, my question is, now, are this actually coincidence? Now, you can say, actually, God is, the two things I want to say. Number one, God is so merciful that he put the saving grace, the story of his gospel, the saving grace, into a foreign land, a far land, billions or if millions of people have no idea of Christianity. Or you can say, um, Satan is so cunning that he can blind millions of, not billions of people, the gospel of Christ that in their culture they celebrate every single year, every single household without even realizing the truth. Now, um, sorry, I lost my place again. Now, the question is, since we're talking about Passover, what was the request that Moses de delivered on behalf of God to Pharaoh? What Moses said to, to Pharaoh? Let my people go. In the Bible, let my people go, quote it, and you can look, look up for it, said nine times. Nine times God said to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may serve me. Isn't God merciful? Hasn't, hasn't um, Pharaoh had enough chance? So, um, sorry, just quickly over here, um, if I lost my track over there. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10, I want to show you something interesting over here. Exodus chapter 10 is precisely talking about 10 plagues. Now, I find this fascinating. The request, let my people go, stopped after the eighth plague. And then what is coming after, which is the ninth plague? What is that? So, um, so uh, Exodus chapter 10, verse 21. It says ninth plague. So basically, from the starting of the ninth plague, there's no more let my people go request. There's no more discussion. Over here, the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thy hand thine hand towards heaven, and that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Do you think darkness could be a plague? Don't you actually experience darkness every single day when you turn off your light, close your eyes? Now, this darkness lasts for three days. What darkness is that? What do you think the darkness is? What do you think when people experience no mercy of God? What do you think when, when there's no grace of God present in their life? No more mercy. God withdrew. By the way, listen to this. Um, verse 23 says, They saw not one another, so they can't even see each other. Um, uh, neither rose any from this place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Now, this is not talking about simply light. This is not talking about the sun disappeared or moon dropped out. This is talking about the grace is, of God is dwelling with you if we choose to. We won't discuss the tenth plague because that's the end of the story. Now, we're talking about let my people go. In Revelation, 
when it's talking about three angels' message and continue, when Revelation 18, when the second message and repeated, let's actually turn to Revelation 18. <clears throat> Revelation 18. Um, sorry, the time is going a little long. Um, so Revelation 18. So over here, obviously, um, we understand the three angels, angels' message is our key as submission. Now, the second angel message that we understand is did not said with a loud voice. Only the angel following say, "Babylon Bab is falling, is fallen, the great city." Right over here, Revelation 18 and verse two it says, "The angel he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying." Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the uh, habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, second angel's message was called out loud and strong. Have a look in verse 4. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Now, if let my people go is a request that God made to Pharaoh and then come out of her, my people is a request God made to you. And this is the final request. I'm not sure that's the one I'm after. Maybe I have got too far. All right. Um, it is. Uh, of Babylon at the time brought to view of the prophecy. I'm not sure it's the one I'm after. <clears throat> yeah, it is one. Uh, at the time brought to view in this prophecy, it is declared that her sin had reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquity. Revelation 18 verse 5. And she has filled up the measure of her guilt and destruction is about to fall upon her. But God still has people in Babylon. That's why the calling, let thy people go also, come out of her, thy people. And before the visitation of his judgment, these faithful ones must be called out and they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence the movement symbolized by an angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory and crying mightily with a strong voice announcing the king, the, sorry, the sin and Babylon of Babylon in connection with his message and the call is heard. Come out of her, my people. And this announcement united with the, th the third angel's message constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. Brothers and sisters, it is time about your father's business. Regardless that you might be returning to church or new to church, they feel like and you have, um, you have lots of burdens and um, you might have some different habits and, you know, just like a prodigal son come back to church, well, you might dress differently. You might still remember the things and that you, you still eat. And regardless in that you are brother, that older brother sitting in the church and for a long time, they just not get used to the world and say, okay, why we have to have the sinner in our house? And regardless, and as you, you come to the Lord through either the way that you want to open your arms when you welcome him back or you want to pursue him really earnestly, for, his, for your journey of life. Remember that you are his own. And this is your own father's request. Come out of her, my people. This is the, uh, the, the scripture reading that we did today. And if the blood of the bulls and the goats and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, which is your brother, the joint heir of the kingdom, and who 
through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God. Purge your, con your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. And from this course, and he is the medi uh, mediator, sorry, mediator of New Testament that by means of death, his death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, and they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And that's the inheritance that God promised. Own it. Own it. Dear Father in heaven, um, um, as much as you forgive us, may we have new everlasting love and to forgive one another as brothers and sisters in the church. May we grow together as a church, um, as your sons and daughters. And while we're in the battle, and please and may you uh, continue lead us uh, from dark, away from darkness into your marvelous light. And, and may we have the courage to stand and because we know that Jesus is standing with us. May your Holy Spirit guide us. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.